Hi everyone, this is Howard Mann speaking, University of Utah. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, today I'd like to start again with uh, Peter. Peter, are you still there? You should be. Yes, I'm here, Howard. Thank I'm you. I'm going to send you a presenter and you'll be able to start. Very good. Great, we can see your screen. So okay. thanks for joining and go ahead. Thanks, Howard. Okay, so I'll start off by, uh, I'll, I'll present a few cardiac cases today. Um, the first one is a cardiac MRI for, uh, the indication was, uh, was pericarditis. And um, look at the, we'll take a look at the image on the top left first. So that's the SSFP. And the first, the first thing that draws attention is this complex um, collection here, which looks like it's in the pericardial space. Um, it has heterogeneous signal and then these thick, thick uh, septations. Um, then the other thing to notice is the, the morphology of the ventricles. They're, uh, they're tubular. And then if we play the, uh, play the cine here, we can notice some uh, paradoxical <laughs> septal motion. Um, as, the, as the ventricles fill, fill in diastole, there's septal motion towards the left ventricle, and then there's decreased motion of the um, right ventricle. Septal bounce. Um, yep, septal bounce, yep. And then um, as we turn attention to the two images on the bottom, those are the delayed enhancement images on the left is the magnitude reconstruction, and the on the right is the PSIR. And, and you can see the um, septal, uh, the, the pericardial enhancement, especially around this, uh, pericardial fluid collection. And you can see on the on the face sensitive images, there's loss of signal within the collection, which is what we would expect within within uh, fluid without contrast, which assumes the lowest signal intensity on PSIR. Uh, and then lastly, we'll show the image on the top right is the, uh, it's another cine, but this one's acquired with uh, free breathing. So less um, lower image quality, lower spatial resolution, but allowing the patient to, to breathe. And um, as we play that, we, we, again, we again observe the septal bounce. And you, as you can see, as the, as the thoracic cavity expands, the septal bounce becomes uh, more pronounced. And then it's less pronounced with expiration. So this is ventricular interdependence. And overall, the diagnosis here is uh, effusive constrictive uh, pericarditis where you have two, basically two physiologic processes. Um, one is the, the we, have the, we have the pericarditis with constrictive physiology, and then we also have increased pressure within the um, pericardial space from the, from the effusion. So there's, a, there, there's likely an element of uh, tamponade physiology. And um, show a similar case. The reason I'm, I, was, I saw this case about a year ago, the reason I was motivated to show it is because a few days ago, I ran into a similar um, similar case at our other hospital. Um, start off by showing this is a younger patient, 26 year old with uh, sickle cell disease, and he presented quite quite ill. Um, so the show is start off by showing his echo. Uh, so you can see a large uh, a large pericardial effusion, um, and then you can see the septations within the effusion. And then basically, this is a pretty une unequivocal um, uh, tamponade here. Uh, or there's a lot of pressure on all on all uh, chambers of the heart, and there's collapse of the of the atria. We'll look at a few more. Let's see if I can show a few of the other um, views here. So large pericardial effusion and uh, basically uh, left ventricular output failure from tamponade. And so they, um, they, they, were, they had to do a, per, uh, a pericardiosynthesis and pericardial window and they took off almost two liters of uh, pericardial fluid. And they also did a, a follow-up cardiac MRI. Um, Just three liters and so here, the images again on the on the top left is the um, SSFP image, 
and we can play the the cine. And so, actually, I'll stop it for a second. The first thing to notice is this um, very markedly thickened uh, pericardium with with a lot of septations, and it looks looks like there's been a lot of inflammation. There's also some fluid here, um, so there's a small residual pericardial effusion, and then again the the tubular morphology of the of the ventricles. Uh, the two images on the bottom le left again are the um, the late gadolinium enhancement images, and you can see enhancement of the the pericardium with some residual pericardial fluid here. And then um, and that, that's actually it that I, I unfortunately the I, I'm not sure why, but we didn't acquire the uh, the free breathing. Um, the free breathing sequence to to, dem to confirm the uh, ventricular interdependence. Oh, Matt, ten floor, ten E. Edward. Hey, Peter, what was the cause of the effusive constrictive pericarditis in each of those cases? Sorry if I missed you saying um, that. Edward, room ten twelve. One second. Um, in the first case, it was uh, acute myelogenous leukemia. And in the second case, they uh, in the second case they couldn't actually uh, come up with a with a cause. Uh, patient does have sickle cell, but they they also biopsied the pericardium, and then the cytology was uh, it was and then the biopsy results just showed fibrinous uh, pericarditis, but the cytology was negative for um, no malignant cells and no no infection. So the first one was leukemic involvement in the pericardium, or was the, it you know? Uh, I, I don't know what the I don't know if they sent the patient has a history of leukemia, but I'm not sure what the I'm not sure if they actually sampled it and, and got a cytology of that in the first case. Yeah. Good. No, those are nice examples. Very nice. Um, and one other fun quick case uh, I was going to show here is so this is a patient uh middle-aged gentleman with um who underwent a uh, uh cardiac transplant in 2009 for myocarditis and um he presented recently um uh, with with heart failure and so the cardiologists uh did an echo and then then they uh there was a positive bubble study and they did notice uh, flow across um, this ASD here, which they they were able to dig up the uh, the surgical report of the transplant and they saw that there was a intraoperatively repaired um, sinus venosis ASD in the um, during the transplant. And so this was this CT was done later and was read by my uh, division chair, Arthur Stillman, and he he saw he so he saw thing he noticed was that there's a anomalous pulmonary venous return here yeah. to the superior vena cava. And so he made the kind of keen observation that that the surgeon likely failed to um, they didn't make the association uh, between the uh, because they repaired the ASD, but they didn't they didn't make the association by counting the pulmonary veins, which are deficient here uh, from the from the recipient to repair also the uh, the uh, partial anomalous pulmonary venous return while they were doing the transplant. So they only repaired the the ASD, and then the actual the patch repair of the ASD was failing, and there was a leak through it. But the other reason the patient ha continues to have a, a shunt is because of the uh, partial anomalous venous return, which was not repaired intraoperatively. So this is the cardiac transplant. And yeah, one, one second, Dr. Stillman wants to make one other comment. If you, if you look at the um, very vascular fat around the coronaries in this patient, you don't see any. Can you, can you just can I scroll through it? It's, it's all muddied, right? So I think this is this is from from allograft vasculopathy, chronic rejection. 
you know, I think we had recognized that or wondered about that in the past art, hadn't we? Like with just stranding around the coronaries and in the epicardial fat, if that was a form of projection. Is there literature on that? I think so. Yeah. Nice. Hmm. And at this time, if you go back to the uh, right superior pulmonary vein area, what do we see again? So you see the you see the anomalous return here. Okay. So, so this was this was this was from the recipient uh, patient. And what was the heart transplant done for? Uh, I think myocarditis, heart failure. Yeah, that would have been that would have been the native. They wouldn't have transplanted the the SVC. No, no. Well, so yeah, so that that's the that's the point is the the SVCs from the native patient. Yeah. They didn't notice. They didn't notice that in the in the native patient by looking at the native patients, because right. they the posterior aspect of the of the left atrium is still from the native patient, so they, they slice open the atrium. So these ostea, the ostea of the um, of the pulmonary veins are from the native patient. Don't they transect the Don't they transect the SBC though to do the transplant? Where do they? Uh, the SBC is transected, but it's transected below where the below the anomalous return. So it's right there at this level. And if we go up, uh, the anomalous return is is superior to that. Got it. Thank you. I'm getting confused because the lungs of this person are the are the is the recipient's lungs. Uh, uh, no, it was a heart transplant, not a lung transplant, right? Heart transplant. Yeah. Yeah, it's a heart. yeah, cardiac transplant. Yeah, so they usually leave a native portion of the left vent or left atrium, like Peter was yeah. saying. So they only anastomose one time instead of having to anastomose all the separate pulmonary veins. So you piggyback. The 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 yeah, sorry to interrupt you. No, go ahead. I was going to show the anastomotic, uh, the anastomotic, exactly what you were saying. The anastomotic sutures are right there for the left atrium. So this. Posterior aspect of the left atrium here is the um, native left atrium, and then this is the the anterior aspect of the donor. The whole heart, the rest of the heart, gets spliced onto this part of the left atrium, which is left over. So the the point was that whatever this posterior aspect of the left atrium has a deficient amount of uh, pulmonary veins. Which suggests that there's also anomalous pulmonary venous return, is what and and also the ASD, which was repaired, but they didn't make the connection to check the to check the uh, SVC. So was it was it a sinus spinosis ASD or was this an A an, or secundum ASD with um with a P, P A P V R on top of it? It looks like a sinus venosis ASD. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Peter. Okay. Good. Uh, who would like to showcase this next? Travis or David or? David, go ahead if you have stuff. I have a couple here. Let's see if um, I can bring up something relevant. Yeah, I'm ready uh, to show you guys a couple of cases. Okay, David, here you are. Good. Can you see a scalp view? Good. With a convex mediastinum and this funny uh, sliver of gas up here. So when I first saw this, um, I thought this was probably a uh, esophagectomy with the stomach pulled up into the chest and the stomach being way up here in the chest, but it turns out that was not what this actually is. So here's what it looks like. Um, this is native esophagus, but there's this big thing in it that's quite long and extensive and has slivers of gas around it. So it occupies about you know, most of the thoracic esophagus tapers off down to the bottom, fairly homogeneous like this. And um, 
you know, let's let's figure out what sort of attenuation we're getting in this. It's uh, mean of 68, so it looks like um, looks like solid tissue. Um, so um, I thought this was a one of those fibrovascular polyps. That's what I thought this long thing was going to be. But they whomped it out, and it was a pedunculated thing that came off fairly easily. So despite the fact that the uh, the um, gastroenterologist who applied echo to this thing thought it was a duplication cyst. It doesn't look anything like a duplication cyst on CT. And it's got high attenuation, doesn't have low attenuation as you would expect with a cyst. So I was thinking fibrovascular polyp, but it turns out to be a polypoid um, lymphoma. So this was a lymphoma that arose on a stalk, was resected fairly easily, I think. Um, but then there was a post-op complication. There was a perforation and eventually the person ended up with an esophageal stent still in that perioperative period now. So maybe that can be removed eventually. So this was a surprising presentation of lymphoma to me. It didn't seem to be in the wall, but it was occupying the lumen as a polypoid uh, mass, a very extensive polyp. I don't know if anybody has seen an esophageal lymphoma that looks like this before. No. This is my first. No. I mean, okay. Seen lymphoma, but not pedunculated. So here it is. Wow. That's very looking like dust. Wouldn't, wouldn't you think of fibrovascular polyp, which we've, we've shown a couple of cases a few years yeah. ago? Yeah, I thought some of them are a little bit lower attenuation, right? They can be, but I, I agree with you. I think that's the most you know, reasonable thing, or even a big lyomyoma. Although right. those are usually submucosal and not mucosal. Right. So the, uh, the thing I remember from my residency days was when you see a bulky esophageal tumor, it's not an adeno or a squamous cancer most likely. It could be something in the muscle series. So it could be a lyomyoma or it could be lymphoma. Lymphoma is a cause of large esophageal tumors, but this is the first intraluminal version of that that I've seen. Okay. So... Um, let me show you another case here. So this person uh, came in this week with this huge heart, very dilated main pulmonary artery, and then huge central left pulmonary artery uh, behind it sitting here. So very big pulmonary arteries and a very dilated right atrium, a big right heart in general and low lung volume. So um, there's also this little mediastinal abnormality down here. Okay, and this is descending aorta here, so there's something that's violating the uh, descending aorta, retracting back into the mediastinum, tapering down. There's this thing that's bulging out. And let me show you what other findings we have here. So we indeed have a large heart. This is abdominal CT. I don't have a full chest CT to show you. And this person is quite anemic. You can see the low attenuation blood pool that is revealing the myocardium of the septum and the free wall of the left ventricle here. Besides that, we have also pericardial effusion, bilateral pleural effusions, and then as we get into the abdomen, we have ascites and a very dense liver here on this non-contrast study. There are also these calcifications floating around in the central mediastinum. I think this is calcified lymphadenopathy. So I don't, I don't have a good explanation for this. If anybody can help me with that, I'd be delighted to hear what you think it is. So um, this person, uh, then on echocardiography has profound pulmonary hypertension. And the person also has these abnormal bones. So if you look at the texture of the vertebral bodies here, you see this kind of porous uh, pattern to expanded thing. And I think the ribs are also a bit expanded too. So this is thalassemia, this is beta thalassemia. And that mass that we saw that was near the descending aorta but was separate from it, this back here, and this is presumably extramedullary hematopoiesis, which likes to hug the spine. Oh. So this is all thal, beta thal, and uh, transfusion dependence, um, anemia, and on liver biopsy, cirrhosis attributed to iron overload from multiple transfusions. So, now, uh, David, the, the lymph nodes are going to be iron deposition as well. I have seen that in in uh, sickle cell with transfusion. Okay. I, I think so. I, I had 
seen a couple of cases in that same area, like gastrohepatic nodes and in the upper abdomen. Mm -hmm. I've talked to a couple of body colleagues and they agreed that they're probably just iron accumulation. So this is just part of the reticuloendothelial take yep. up of, 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 of iron. Okay, well, that's a very good explanation. It'd be interesting to see if we ever do get the rest of the chest on CT, whether there's also mediastinal and hyalur lymph, uh, lymph node calcification as well. Okay, so this is beta thal, and the, the thalassemia was presumed to be the cause of the of and and the liver disease, probably the causes of his profound pulmonary hypertension. His pulmonary hypertension was probably also contributing to his um, to his liver disease by backing up pressures. Although the inferior vena cave is not as dilated as I would have seen before when people have such bad heart disease. Okay, so I don't know, uh, I, I have very little experience with beta thalassemia. We don't have a population that has this in a, in a high rate here. I know that there are places in the Midwest where it's fairly common because of the ethnicity of their uh, patient population. And I, I don't know whether people have seen pulmonary hypertension before as attributable to beta thalassemia. Does anybody have any lore about that? Um, no. Right. What do the lungs look like on a on a lung window? Because I'm thinking, you know, do we have pulmonary hypertension on the basis of increased pulmonary vascular resistance? Uh, do we have? Because I didn't this, see this dilated, I didn't see dilated pulmonary veins, but the person's anemic. You know, anemia, severe anemia, chronic anemia, high output state, but. Mm -hmm. Certainly patients with sickle cell can get very severe pulmonary, small vessel pulmonary vascular disease. So you have increased pulmonary vascular resistance and pulmonary hypertension right. in that population. Yeah. But in this I'm person, I'm not sure. Lodging, how that might come about. I don't quite know how it goes with thalassemia, though. I don't know whether these people have, you know, occlusive uh, disease in their, in their pulmonary circulation. I can understand that with sickle, but um, I'll have to read more about beta thalassemia to see if there's any mechanism for sludging or things like that. Yeah, or is it just over circulation? I don't know. Just a high output failure sort of thing. Who knows? What, okay. Was there left ventricle functioning? Uh, the left ventricle function on echo was, was, was called normal. LV was normal. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, I'll post some more. I'll post some more detail. I'll review the echo report and and summarize the gist of that too when I post this case. Okay, those are the two cases I wanted to show. Great, right, thanks, thanks, Travis. Do you have any this week? Yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, let's see. Give me one second. I upgraded to the new operating system and now it's asking for permission to, to record. Okay, that's interesting. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Good. Okay. Yeah, let's, um, I was pulling this up really quick. This is lymphadenopathy and thalassemia MRI and they're talking about the iron levels in, on MRI. I couldn't find any good hyper intense or hyper dense CT lymph nodes, but I think that's probably what it is, is iron deposition. Like I said, I've talked to some abdominal radiologists about that before, but these, these cases are kind of interesting. So this is a radiograph I saw yesterday and you know, my first thought, I'm wondering is gonna be the same as your first thought. So what do you guys think? Um, let's see. In, well, there obviously, is, there's volume loss on the left, right? Correct? Yep. Yeah. Also, opacity within the left upper lobe, volume loss. There's some other opacities in that left hemithorax. It's yep. hard to know whether they're located in the pleural space or lung or combinations thereof. And I 
don't know if the left supraaortic mediastinum is abnormal with some leftward, excuse me, rightward deviation of the trachea. And yeah, that's a good observation too. But I mean, you kind of agree that like first gut, maybe some component of left upper lobe collapse, right? Like with the volume loss and some of this supraaortic opacity. Yeah, yeah. At least that's what I was thinking at first. And some of this stuff we can't explain. Um, but this is the CT. So this this is a patient who is a diabetic. He's got hypertension, you know, whatever, a lot of other things. And he came in with, with a few days of worsening fever, hypotension. He doesn't actually have any, you know, real lung involvement. I think, Howard, your observation of the trachea being displaced is a good one. You can see on the CT, this is all modeled fluid and gas, and it extends both from his neck and his sternocleidomastoid and some of his strap muscles directly into the mediastinum. So in the middle mediastinum, the you know, well, prevascular space and a little bit in the middle mediastinum here. And then I think this is all just pleural thickening and, and a little effusion that's unrelated to the current thing. So that's what's given us the volume loss. But this all turned out to be necrotizing fasciitis and direct extension with mediastinitis. Whoa. They went in and debrided this, and they got gram-positive cocci in pairs. So probably some sort of, of streptococcal origin. I don't know yet. We're still waiting on final speciation. But I don't think I've ever seen mediastinitis from this much like flagrant extension from the neck and the anterior chest wall like this. But yeah, I kind of thought the volume loss was going to be acute, but that was a little bit of a misleading thing. So uh, Travis, what, what do you think the uh, the site of origin of this infection was then? Would you, was so, it or? He, um, in addition to his prior amputations, I guess he has a suprapubic catheter. So I don't know if this is just hematogenous from a urinary tract infection. Maybe it's entercoccus. You know, I, I don't know yet, but that's a good question, David, and we don't know. It, just, it doesn't sound like there is any antecedent trauma or un other things to the, the neck or chest. And it doesn't look like he has an underlying pneumonia. His long parenchyma looks fine. Do you think it was seeding so, of that joint? Do you think it's the sternoclavicular joint? Does well, it, it certainly is. Yeah, the, the sternoclavicular joint's involved. Yeah, whether that was the primary site and then it just worked its way out and in, I don't know. This It goes pretty high up in his neck too. It's, yeah, you can see, and it almost goes into the retropharyngeal space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or at least along the, the carotids here and, and here. So yeah, I, I don't know. But well, just crazy, you know, crazy amount of involvement there. So they they opened him up and, and put drains every place? Yeah, combined ENT and thoracic surgery yeah so, and he's he's doing okay and so i don't know you know i think when we think of necrotizing fasciitis it's more of you know gangrenous organisms and it doesn't there was infection i don't know how much of this was actually necrotic that needed to be debrided so i don't know if that's the exact term but it's definitely a, a gas forming infection that's in multiple compartments so wow very dramatic Oof. Yeah, well, that one, I'm going to show this one. So this also came in within the last week. And this is kind of not what you would expect, I think, from the radiograph either. So this is a woman in her 40s who came in with a syncopal event. And there's looks to be a little bit of volume loss, probably a little bit of elevation of the right hemidiaphragm, but then this haze, hazy opacity in the right lower hemithorax. It's probably a combination of, of fusion and probably atelectasis. But it looks like there's more volume loss than anything else. Do you agree? Yeah. Well, check yeah. out her CT. Yeah. This CT was done in an outside hospital. And she's had volume loss, of course, from SCAR. So unrelated to the prior or to the current episode. This is all a large hemothorax. And she has an actively rupturing thoracoabdominal aorta, and you can see the active extravasation right here. And she managed to survive. She went to surgery and had a, a long segment aortic reconstruction. And 
she's in her 40s and so my question for everyone you can see the amount of mass effect it even has on the on the heart her pulmonary veins are compressed and then this is all hematoma some of it may be extra pleural i don't i thought maybe there was a little extra pleural fat somewhere but it, either pleural or extra pleural but um, it's interesting that she's so young and her aorta looks reasonable until about right here and then you can see all of this has calcification extending from her thoracic into her abdominal aorta even down into her iliac vessels mm. so i guess my first thought was some sort of vasculitis uh, but and she doesn't have a history of of an elastopathy like ehlers danlos she is a, a chronic drug user and alcoholic so i don't know i mean for this extent i wouldn't even think some sort of chronic infectious aortitis i don't know any thoughts because unfortunately they didn't send the the tissue the pathology as far as i can tell it's not the usual distribution of um of uh, tertiary syphilis that's usually ascending aorta yeah and stuff like that but she's got bad habits to be <laughs> way worth checking yeah. for that no that's a good thought but and, uh, yeah and speak to Chris. Would, yeah does she have any involvement of her brachiocephalic arteries or other large arteries to indicate some kind of chronic well, like i was thinking like even takiyasu or something yeah, right. but it certainly can give you aneurysms it doesn't have to be stenosis so, I mean, it's it's an, mostly an academic question at this point, but yeah, she came in with active extrav right there. Gosh. And the the chronicity of her lung volume loss, maybe from prior tuberculosis, you know, given that it's upper lobe, I don't know with her, I don't know what her living situation was, but you know, certainly looks like it could be old TB or old necrotizing pneumonia. Those were a couple of interesting cases. This so, one, uh, oh, Travis, yeah. Uh, tuberculosis as a cause of um, aortic infection. How often does that happen? I I don't know. I don't. Art, if you and Peter are still on there, anyway, I don't know. No, I've never seen no. that. Mm -mm. Uh, no, I don't think I've seen it. So, well. Moving on to the theme of unusual uh, radiographic appearances, and some this one's a little bit more of a whiteout than the other one. And this is a very interesting case. This is an, a man who has reconstruction plates in his clavicle and ribs, as you can see. And he is, how old is he now? He's 60. And apparently, when he was in his teens, so almost 50 years ago, he was in a motor vehicle crash, had all of this stuff repaired. And has been has had a long-standing history of decades of intermittent chest pain, but came in recently with worsening chest pain, worsening dyspnea, abdominal pain, and actually had elevated liver function tests. And you can see that he's got a, a substantial effusion. He has some, maybe a little bit of aerated lung, and we see certainly bowel higher than it should be. Now, this radiograph was done here. This CT was done at the outside hospital the day before. And we can see that he has the dependent viscera sign with his liver you're probably thinking or knew where i was going with this except i think there's a little bit of a twist and you can see that most of his liver or at least most of the right half of his liver some of his other abdominal contents including transverse colon are up in his chest and his liver function tests continued to rise and I'll show you the coronal on this study, because this was the repeat. When the effusion was getting larger, he now has near complete atelectasis of his right lung. And on the arterial phase, you can see that there's a waste in the liver right here. Actually, the venous phase is probably a better one to show it on. Maybe this is a little less noisy too. Yeah, and so you can see this is where the, the, the waste of the, or the collar of this diaphragmatic hernia is, this post-traumatic hernia, and you can see a little bit What's interesting is when you look at the liver, you can see that the liver parenchyma right around this looks a little lower attenuation. And it's on both sides of the diaphragm. There's a little focal abnormality in his liver. And, he, and immediately, he has bile duct dilation up in the chest. So this is exerting mass effect. And it looks like somewhat incarcerating his liver. If I show you the axial, 
you'll see what this translates to. You can see right here, this is all liver parenchyma that's low attenuation right in here. It almost looks like it's a little intraparenchymal abscess, except it's not that defined. That was above, this is below the diaphragm. So this is worrisome for incarceration, especially with the, the elevated liver function tests and his worsening symptoms. And at surgery, when they, they had difficulty, but they finally did reduce this. And the surgeon described that the, there was compression of the liver and that it was, it was basically pressure necrosis on the liver from the diaphragm. diaphragm. Hmm. So Gosh. that was, yeah pretty interesting and the billy and he also had some biliary obstruction as well so that must have been from the the liver is you know i don't know why it was 50 years ago and this now presented but you know we've shown lots of post-traumatic and iatrogenic diaphragmatic hernias this is one of the more dramatic ones i've seen and i'm assuming the right pleural effusion is just reactive due to the worsening inflammation because there was nothing growing in it and he didn't have ascites uh, good question. Uh, just a little bit. Probably same thing. Well, you know, so. he's got a, he's got a little bit of left pleural fluid, and then he's got soft tissue edema. So maybe part of this is related to his treatment. If he was in hospital and received fluids, because he's sure he's got generalized soft tissue edema, and he's got a bit of, he's got left pleural fluid too. So maybe I yeah, and that all increased from this the CT the week before at the outside hospital. I agree. But that's tremendous. Yeah, so incar incarcerated liver with resultant ischemic injury to the liver and elevated liver function tests. And even part of the colon was described as abnormal yep. in the report. Yep. It was, it's up here too. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, Howard, I will stop there. There's one more. I want to give you time to present if we, if we have an opportunity at the end. Uh, why don't you go ahead? I've got two, so I'll have time okay. before the end of the hour to show my two. So this is one, Art, if you're still there, this is one I was texting you about yesterday. This is a 19-year-old who has, I don't remember what their lymphoproliferative disorder was or what their lymphoma or leukemia was, but they had bone marrow transplant a few years ago and graft-versus-host disease of organs. And back in June had dyspnea, you can see there's small effusions, and started to have a troponin leak. Now you can see the right ventricle's not squeezing all that great. The left ventricle, the ejection fraction was low normal. The apical segments aren't, you know, they're a little thinned. You know, maybe there's something here. We'll come back to that on the subsequent study, if there's a small little thrombus there or not. So the but the delayed enhancement imaging at this time is, is pretty dramatic. If I can find the uh, good, yeah, here, we'll look at the four chamber. And he didn't have any sort of viral prodrome or anything, but you can see he has multiple areas of delayed enhancement. Some of them look more subendocardial, maybe a little bit you know, in, in varying areas, some of it a little bit more transmural, maybe even a little bit of subepicardial. And so this was some sort of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. They were uncertain. They were wondering if he could have graft-versus-host disease or, or myocarditis. They did a, a myocardial biopsy via right-sided approach, and it was consistent with a lymphocytic myocarditis. And the pathologist said in the, that the, it could be either you know, graft-versus-host disease, which involvement of the heart, as far as I know, is very rare, or they, you know, they hedged and said maybe infection. But he was treated for a while for graft-versus-host disease, and then his immunosuppression decreased. And then he came back in a couple of days ago for a repeat MRI because his troponins were going back up again. And his function, as you can see from a couple of days ago, his LV function is now less than 20%. The basal segments squeeze some, but the mid and apical segments are barely thickening at all. And on this CT, or on this MR, I do think he has a small apical thrombus. And the enhancement, he was, he was having a little bit of trouble with breath holding, but you can see worsening, enhance, delayed enhancement, thinning, 
throughout the apical segment, some in the mid segments. So whatever this is, they're treating this as presumptive graft versus host disease affecting the myocardium and resulting in the lymphocytic myocarditis, which I've never seen before. I mean, it seems like it could happen, but I'm, I was hoping Seth would be on here, but I don't know, Art, if you're on, if you care to comment. But. Well, I just have a question, Travis. When you said lymphocytic, were there any giant cells? Good question. No, they did not see any giant cells, right? Because that would be a good explanation for a fulminant myocarditis. You're right. And I don't know if that could be sampling error because that, you know, since I've never seen this and I was having trouble finding much in the literature, I wonder if it is just giant cell myocarditis, but I don't know. Whatever it is, his function is, is, you know, is going downhill quickly. Hmm. So yeah, I'll I may ask them that specific question though. That's a good thought. Yeah, and certainly you know giant cell has a bad prognosis. Yeah. So all right, well that's it for my cases, Howard. Great, thank you. Okay, here is my uh, first case. Uh, this person, I'll show you some detailed history in a moment, but was transferred to our hospital with a history of a rash, but then a, then a very rapid decline in lung function. I can't, I'm not sure whether when he arrived he was already intubated, but you can see here the first image I'm showing you, he's intubated with extensive lung disease. So a person previously healthy, with a history of some kind of rash, and then proceeding very rapidly to acute respiratory failure. Uh, just a little bit later in the same day, no, that's about the same time. This one is um, a couple days later, and you can see now that he is being treated with venovenous ECMO for his very severe lung disease and acute respiratory failure. Still has diffuse opacities and a little bit of pleural fluid. This next is imaging on the same day. And I'll give you a feel for his lungs, which of course are diffusely abnormal. Um, not surprisingly, when a patient is this ill and intubated, there'll be more opacity very typically in the lower lung zones because these areas of lung are heavy, they're more atelectatic. This gradient from anterior to posterior is pretty common in patients with, for example, ARDS, prolonged ventilator therapy, or not even prolonged, um, irrespective of the cause. And then down here, um, we see he's got air-filled bronchi and he's got pleural fluid. Let me show you another image on the 27th. So we're going from the 18th to the 27th. Uh, he's still very ill, of course. Here we see that we now have pneumomediastinum, which we can easily attribute to the Macklin phenomenon. Um, prolonged ventilator therapy, non-compliant lungs. We can see areas where there is air in the bronchovascular sheaths related to veins and arteries along with that. And in looking at the bronchi in the lower lungs, they're quite dilated. Um, perhaps there's fibrosis there. So a person with a rapid onset of respiratory failure, very ill, requiring venovenous ECMO. So now I'll show you the history and there you can see some notes. So he's 40 years of age, developed a rash. And then because of the rash, he had a dermatology consult. He had a rheumatology consult. You can see here that the rheumatology folks got a history of elevated CK and aldolase, but also found on a myositis panel positive MDA5 antibody. So certainly, at least in my hospital, when the pulmonary folks, depending on the context or whatever the context, order so-called ILD panel, uh, these are the, they typically will, will order this one. And here are the components of the 
panel that are done, at least at my hospital, you can see there are antibodies related to scleroderma. There are some that are related to rheumatoid arthritis. There are some then related to the antithensitase antibodies. And then at the bottom of the list, these are the ones that they evaluate, particularly for patient. And these are the ones that one would be concerned about if the patient may have an inflammatory myopathy. So these down towards the bottom of the list are the ones that are associated with myositis. And the one that's positive in this person is the MDA5. It turned out that the skin lesions were actually very severe, and now he's got lesions that are described as necrotic, which is really disturbing. So the diagnosis so far is that he's one of these patients that has a very severe lung involvement with the MDA5 antibody. And it turns out that sometimes some of these patients with um, myositis may have a presentation like this, that is, they develop um, a very severe lung disease and it progresses very quickly. So here's one particular article that talks about lung involvement in anti-MDA5 disease. And you can see that in this particular abstract in their patients, that the onset was acute, very severe. Some of their patients ended up in the ICU even, like this patient. And I know David has shown a couple of cases, if I remember correctly, of MDA5 antibody-associated ILD. But I can't remember, David, if any of your patients presented this acutely, this severely, and acquired intubation, etc., for the lung disease. Well, they didn't. They weren't as acute as this. I don't. I think some of them actually did require intubation eventually. But it looked more like an NSI rapidly evolving NSI peep pattern, not like. And ARDS stuff like this, so this is new to me. We, yeah. I think we've, I showed one that was similar, you know, just rapid onset of acute lung injury. And David, I mean, this one's so bad, maybe there would be some NSIP under there that we just never would see right in the lower lobes. But you know, this, I think MDA5 is one of the reasons, you know, the whole old diagnosis of acute interstitial pneumonia or AIP. I bet most of those, or the Hammond-Rich syndrome, are probably you know, myositis cases like this that just didn't have antibody tests at the time. Yeah. And I yeah. think this is the, also an important case. We actually had a recent patient admitted, you know, and the patient was vaping, but you know, the, like the, the working diagnosis talks about how for vaping, you, you, know, you have to evaluate for connective tissue disease. So it's only in the absence of that or infection or other known exposure that you can you know, diagnose acute lung injury due to vaping, because this would be a good example of, of something else that could cause it too. Yeah. So yeah, very dramatic. And he's still obviously very ill, still being, um, still on, on venovenous ECMO. There wow. is um, a chase radiograph from today actually. Hey, David, I think, isn't Sudakar collecting cases of MDA5? He was. I don't okay. know what it is. So uh, this is dramatic. Um, this is the first guy that I've seen with it, too, because typically um, I think it's female patients. I think all of ours have been female. Yeah, they're treating him with big, big, big time anti um, right. uh, immunosuppressive agents. I think they've added. Maybe most recently rituximab, I think, but I think his prognosis is is unfortunately pretty guarded. So that's the provisional diagnosis. Seems to be a fairly strong diagnosis in the absence of other plausible explanations for the acute onset of respiratory failure and severe skin disease. By the way, this Travis, your uh, your vaping. Um you know, letter to the New England Journal is now in the print edition as of uh, yesterday evening. Cool. So well, we have a, and Howard's involved, the, the AJR paper just came out yesterday. Okay. So yeah. More, a little bit more detailed. Got it. So this is um, an interesting patient. So he came to us with a history that on abdominal CTs in the context of either staging or evaluation, of a testicular malignancy, 
funny vessels were noted in the lower chest. And sure enough, down here, one can see quite readily those funny vessels in the chest. And um, I think, because I've only, I don't think I've seen this before myself. Maybe if you've seen this before, maybe even with just a limited series like this of a funny vessel here and then right down here, someone could make that diagnosis because if you've seen it before, I'm sure you probably could, even without a chest CT. Sorry about that. Let me bring in the um, thin cuts here. So here we go. So we'll start up here and look at the RCA. There it goes. Big, big. It's come down adjacent to right atrium. Huge, huge. Down here, huge vessels. And right about here, the RCA is dumping into the coronary sinus. So an RCA to coronary sinus fistula or connection. Let me play this for you. RCA injection. Goes right in there. And I think it's the first one I've personally seen, but one can find lots of case reports of this. This is one of the things that happens. There's one really nice article on, on the fistula, similar findings in those images. So, nice case, RCA to coronary sinus fistula. Have we shown one before, guys? I can't remember. Yeah, we've had various ones, either coronary cameral fistulae. I think Seth may have shown one directly into the coronary sinus, similar to this. I think you're right though, based on that non-gated study, if you see a dilated tortuous coronary, in an, especially in an adult, you have to think about some sort of fistula. Yeah, exactly. So what, uh, how, what will they do with this? Um, I don't know. Uh, let's see, you've got a left to right shunt that's quite large. I wonder what's, what is perfusing the, um, the heart muscle on the right. They can try, if it's just a single vessel like this, they can try to coil it. Oftentimes these fistulae involve multiple vessels, which mm -hmm. makes it a little bit more complicated. Or Either coil it or, or find a place where they could put a bigger occluder device. Yeah, you know, with varying degrees of success. Because since you have a normal origin of the coronaries, Oops. you're not really risking ischemia if you occlude that, because you're still going to perfuse via the right. It's just you're getting more steel from, you know, well, it, it's, you know, you're going to get steel phenomenon when it just preferentially is flowing back into the coronary sinus instead of into the myocardium since it's a lower pressure system. Yeah, I just I just wonder whether there are many myocardial branches that formed at all, given that all the blood's just going to go yeah. gushing right on by them. So I just, you know, what I just wonder what is perfusing that. Yeah, you can see some. There's still some small acute marginal branches that when Howard was scrolling through there. Okay. Uh huh. This is the left side, obviously. I'm just looking to yeah. see whether. The There's probably some communication space. inferiorly too, because the you can see they're barely including it in the field of view, but it looks like some tortuous vessels inferiorly that are likely forming some sort of collateral. Okay. Very good. Thanks for the cases, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Peter. It's good to see you on here. Thanks, Travis. Yeah, good to hear. Good to see you. Take care, guys. Take, Take care, care everyone. Thank you.